Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see all of you who are here on this beautiful uh, Saturday morning in Aspen. And hello to the people who are watching. I gather hundreds of you because uh, this is also being streamed live. Um, I'm Francis Collins. I have the privilege of serving as the moderator on this panel of Gen Z innovators. You probably have figured out I am not Gen Z. <laughs> These folks over here are the Gen Z innovators, otherwise known as Zoomers. They're the Zoomers, I'm the Boomer. We're gonna see how that all mixes all right. together here. And they are an amazing quartet of talented young people in the STEM area, each of whom has done something pretty remarkable, or in some cases, several things remarkable, <laughs> that are the reason why they got picked out of the entire universe of possible people to be on this panel, and this is the creme de la creme. So you're gonna hear some really interesting things from each of them. I will very briefly tell you who they are, and then I will ask each of them to spend maybe three to five minutes giving you a snapshot of what kinds of science they have undertaken that is really pretty electrifying. And then we'll get engaged in a conversation uh, with me and them, and then we'll open it up to your questions, so please be thinking as you listen to their presentations of things you'd like to hear more about. So that's where we are, and let me introduce them, starting with closest to me, Deja Taylor. She has done uh, remarkable work in the area of global health, and she's currently at the University of Iowa studying global health, and she will tell you about a particular approach she has taken to try to identify risks of infection in a surgical site in a low resource setting, uh, where you could know that there's something that needs attention without having to have the finest technologies that we have taken for granted in our medical centers, which just aren't available other places. So Deja Taylor. Next to her, Avi Schiffman, uh, currently a student at Harvard. He is, by his definition, an internet activist, uh, known particularly uh, for having put up one of the very first COVID-19 websites in COVID-219.live, which then collected data about cases across the world. I went there this morning, it's still collecting data. It was refreshing every 12 minutes or so. So, Avi, I guess you were pretty busy up all night again, okay. <laughs> and more recently, other things he's done related to Ukraine, to Black Lives Matter. So you'll hear from him about what it means to be an internet activist when you have the skills to do so. And then next to Avi is Gitanjali Rao. I don't know where to begin. She has a <laughs> breathtaking array of inventions, lead in the water, uh, a new technique for detecting opioid addiction uh, using genetics, uh, an anti-bullying approach uh, to websites. She's Time Magazine's um, Kid of the Year and Top Young Innovator, and has written a whole book about this, so we'll hear from Gitanjali about that. And at the end, Haley Hardcastle, who has this interesting title, her current uh, title is that she is the Secretary of Mental Health at the University of Oregon where she manages with other students to focus particularly on this critical area, and some of you went to the session last night about the deep concerns we have about mental health in young people. She and her colleagues, but led by her, managed to get the Oregon legislature uh, to pass a law saying that students should have a mental health day when they need one. I think that's uh, something we've all thought about, but she made it the law. So, yeah. there you have it, uh, the uh, Gen Z innovators. <laughs> And maybe we'll just go in that same order, which means Deja, right. say a bit more about what you've been doing in All this right. space. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Deja Taylor, and when I was a junior in high school, I created color-changing stitches that are able to detect infection through the pH imbalance, so the initial sign of infection, which leads to the greatest margin of um, non-invasive effective treatment, so antibiotics, right? And I created this solution Originally as a science fair project, um, I had no previous science experience. Um, I thought I was gonna go into like government and policy and, um, and STEM just kept pulling me back. <laughs> and um, so from there, I, um, I went on to the science fair circuit and I went all the way to the Regeneron Science Talent Search, which is quoted as the most prestigious science competition for high school seniors. And I placed top 40 out of about 2,000 applicants. And from there, um, I was able to patent my, my medical device domestic and internationally. And since then, I've formed this into a new biotech um, med device company. So that's what I'm working on now. Wow. wow. <laughs> Excellent. OK, Avi, tell us Hi, more everyone. about you. Yeah, right. so I guess I like to call myself an internet activist. That doesn't 
really mean that much, but what I like to think that means is I make these websites about current issues going on in the world, mm -hmm. and because the internet is so sp spread out around the world and so many people have a phone, they can just go and on the internet and access all these websites I've made. So um, the biggest one that we're talking about here is this coronavirus tracking website I made in early January of 2020, where you can go to this site and it tells you like the quick facts, total confirmed cases, total disease, total recovered, all that information there right at a glance. Um, and it became one of the biggest coronavirus tracking sites uh, all around the world. It was used by governments, health departments, scientists, by hundreds of millions of people. It was, it was really cool. And again, that was just entirely just a website that you can go to on your phone. And um, that's a way of a kind of activism where I don't actually have to be protesting or anything like that. I can just be sitting in my room on my laptop and make these websites um, and still have a very big impact. So I've also made this Ukrainian website when I saw there was the war going on that helps Ukrainian refugees find available housing all around the world. So you could sign up like you do on Airbnb, but offer that you can house refugees and then refugees can easily go on this website. It's translated into you. Ukrainian, et cetera. And then I was partnering with a lot of organizations that were on the ground in Poland, Germany, et cetera. And uh, so far, that website's helped house over 25,000 families, which has been pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a few other websites. Back in 2020, I made one tracking the Black Lives Matter protests. You could find where and when they were happening. I live in Seattle, so there's like a whole lot of that stuff happening. Um, I also made something for the US presidential election. And I'm currently working on something for the whole abortion crisis happening right now. Oh. So if anyone has any ideas, you can let me know. But oh, a lot of cool I, stuff you can do with the internet. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Avi. Katanjali, tell us about this <laughs> wide variety of things you've worked on. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for letting me be on this panel today with so many other incredible people. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, so my name is Katanjali Rao. I'm a little bit younger than everyone else on here. I'm about to be a senior in high school. Um, so I'm 16 years old, and I've really just spent my time learning. Um, so I just like to say, you know, before anything else, I look towards problem solving as a means for the way that I look at the world around me. I recognize a problem, and I try and come up with ways to solve it rather than, I guess, waiting around for someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so over the past three years, my work has kind of been split into multiple different areas. One is my own research and innovations that I come up with, the second being I guess almost like an advocacy side of things and trying to help other students recognize their potential as well. So within the research side, um, I've worked again through a plethora of different fields, one of which was my device to help detect for lead in drinking water, which probably garnered the most recognition. It's called Tethys and it uses carbon nanotube sensor technology to provide almost instantaneous results on your phone. Um, I also created a device called Epione to help diagnose for opiate addiction at an early stage. And once research is complete, that aims to be the first ever clinical tool to diagnose for addiction. It uses a protein-based biomarker indicator in your body um, with a gene that we all have called the mu opioid receptor. And it's able to form this correlation to an addiction status. And then again, send all the results to your phone just because I love building apps so much. Yeah. Um, and then I also work very closely with UNICEF to build an anti-cyberbullying service, which is almost like a block of code or an API that can be added to a variety of different front ends. And it's built in a way that it's a non punitive approach towards bullying. So think of it as spell check, but for cyberbullying. And it adds the cyberbullying filter capability and a lot of the different things that you can do. So when you send an email, similar to how you wouldn't want to have grammar issues in it, you can also check for any, I guess, unconscious insults that you may add to it, because it happens more than you think. So yeah, that's a little bit about the research side. Uh, right now, I flew in late last night because I'm doing research in Cambridge at the Koch Institute, um, looking at integrated cancer research with nanoscience. So super interesting stuff there. And we'll be moving to infectious diseases and how that looks in the world around us. I'm kind of just exploring everything around me to figure out what exactly I want to do beyond high school. Now, that's my research side of things. <laughs> um, I have a completely different side of things where I focus on connecting with students across the world because that's something that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm very passionate about influencing the current education system into incorporating innovation and problem solving into every single thing that we do. Mm. And I think that's such a crucial part of what we're doing. We talk about science, social studies, math, English classes, but we never truly talk about its application in the real world as well. And that's exactly where outreach comes in for students. So I run these innovation workshops and I've worked with about 68,000 students across 42 countries over the past two years, um, whether that's virtually or in person. 
It's taught me, it's taught me a lot. I hope I've taught them a lot. Um, I've also created a book to go alongside it because I can't mentor every single kid in this universe, but I'd love for them to take away the same things. But each student comes out of these workshops with an idea as well as a process that they can use to take it into the real world. And one that's very near and dear to my heart is working with the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, who is a group of these students who have ideas, who have a goal, who have honestly a very, very big sense of passion in what they're doing and coming up with ideas and innovating for the future. But they have a lack of resources and a lack of guidance. So I've worked with them, um, helped them bring their ideas to life, help mentor them to apply them into challenges, receive fundraising for a lot of the things that they're doing as well. Um, and along with that, I fundraise for them to have iPads, laptops, books, um, furniture, and all sorts of other materials to bring their ideas to life. And I truly recognize the potential in students. And I always like to say that everything that I do across my research, across my workshops, is rooted at this very sole idea of empathy. Um, I think kindness is really what brings my visions to life and it should bring everyone else's visions to life as well because that's truly what's changing our world for the better. But you know I have no intentions of stopping here. I have more to do. I want to do more. Um, so yeah keep following my work in the next couple of years but I appreciate your time. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> and Haley tell us about what you've been yes. up to with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Haley Hardcastle. I am an education policy student at the University of Oregon, and I'm a youth mental health advocate. Um, I've been in this space for about five years now, um, and all of my work began when I was a high school student facing my own mental health challenges, and we passed House Bill 2191 in 2019. Um, it was the first of its kind in the US, and it allows students to take a mental health day off of school the same way you would a physical health day. Um, all of the rules still apply. The parent needs to be the one to call. The mental health day will be recorded, and you can only take um, a certain amount of them per term. However, this is really a um, policy of principle. We really wanted to show young people that their mental health is just as important as their physical health, and it's connected as well, the two of them. Um, this is now a law in 11 states across the United States, and it's proposed in five. That includes the entire West Coast and here in Colorado. Um, and what I spend my days doing now is I connect with young people, usually via social media, to mentor them on how they can make this mental health day law a reality in their school, school district, or state. Um, so expect more to come in the next few years, many more states passing that law. Um, but you know, through my process of passing mental health days in my own state and learning more about the mental health field, I realized that that was sort of um, a band-aid, a short-term solution for a much larger societal and systemic problem of the youth mental health crises. And so now I work with the Oregon Department of Education to lobby for, fund, and implement social emotional learning standards in our K-12 schools. Um, many other states are also beginning this work. Um, I've also worked with the Oregon School Based Health Alliance to build physical um, clinics attached to our elementary schools so that way low income students like I was when I was a child can visit clinicians and therapists right there on their campus. And um, most recently, I'm one of the founders of an organization called Work To Be Well, which creates student-created, clinically vetted um, mental health lesson plans to be implemented in K-12 classrooms. And the best part about this organization is we're backed by Providence Healthcare and a lot of really amazing um, clinicians. And so we're able to offer this for free. And um, that's some work that I'm really, really proud of. I really focus a lot on upstream solutions to mental health. Um, we've heard a lot this weekend about what we can do about the crises right now. But as a young person, I'm looking forward and I'm thinking about what's gonna happen to my peers you know, in 10 or 20 years and how we can prevent those serious, life-changing mental health um, issues now. Um, so one big answer I see to that is really in the education system. As an education policy student, I know that the education system is overburdened already. Um, but if we can make the case to our legislators, to business leaders, important people, I'm sure many of you in this room, that investing in our youth's mental health is not only the moral thing to do, but it's also an incredibly important economic investment um, as a society, then we can really face this youth mental health crisis head on. Yeah, thank you.
Well, what an amazing lineup uh, of talent here. And uh, when I asked them to each talk for maybe three to five minutes, if I'd asked uh, an adult panel to do that, uh, we'd have gotten through about the first one now. <laughs> this group is like, got it, and p pack all the information right in there. But it raises a lot of questions. Please be thinking about yours. I'm gonna start out. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with Avi. How do you choose projects? People are hearing a lot of ideas floating out here, but presumably, if you're an innovator, you can't innovate on everything, unless you're Gitanjali. Uh, <laughs> you have to decide, okay, this is a place where I'm gonna be able to make a contribution. Uh, internet activism sounds like a pretty wide a landscape of opportunity. How do you decide when to jump in? That is a good question. I've really thought about it. Um, <laughs> I guess there's, there's always something happening around the world. There's always some earthquake or natural disaster, or pandemic. Um, so I really do have to choose, like, Am I, if I'm going to make a website, which does take a lot of time and effort still, especially because I have to maintain it, and by now I'm maintaining like a billion different websites at the same time, and it's also pretty expensive too. I have to pay for the servers, um, and when there are this many people using the websites, it, it really gets quite expensive. Um, so I don't know. I guess if it's, if it's important and people care about it, then and, and if I have an idea, then I'll, I'll make something for it. I mean, I never really pause to, to see if it if I should really do it, all those kind of things, I just kind of immediately go and do it. After the Ukrainian war started, I immediately went back home and, and looked at what was happening, and I saw that this was the biggest refugee crisis um, in Europe since World War II, and I knew I had to do something, and I immediately started working on it. I didn't really you know, compare, should I should work on this, or should I work on this. Uh, when I made the coronavirus website, that was in early January in 2020, and that was like months before it was even called COVID. So I don't know. It just um, If it's important, then I guess I'll do it. And, and apparently you'd have, yes. That, that, you can see the drive that's present in all four of these. Um, Haley, where does drive come from? Where does your drive come from to do this? You could have done a lot of other things, or maybe you'd let somebody else worry about what was happening in terms of the broad sweep of mental health and just taking care of your own issues. What, 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 what's that about? Where, where is that from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was speaking with my fellow panelists the other night, actually, and we were talking about how a lot of our drive comes from our personal experiences, our lived experience as young people. Um, I like to tell all the young people that I connect with as a mentor that their superpower is being a young person, and all the expertise that they need is their lived experience at this time. Um, so that's really where my drive comes from, is my experience with mental health as a youth. If you heard my opening session, um, I had a bit of anxiety there. I was diagnosed with a trauma-induced anxiety disorder at age seven um, after some traumatic events in my family. And then I grew up you know, in a low-income household and um, with a single mother, and I wasn't able to access mental health resources in the community. You know, getting diagnosed was a real privilege, and I was lucky that my school helped me a lot. So um, my drive really comes from trying to offer other students the same resources that I was lucky enough to access. That's a great response. Uh, Deja, you're obviously uh, somebody who's focused particularly on global health, and I think you are uh, studying global health now at Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, say something about what the innovation landscape looks like uh, for the kinds of applications that would help people in low and middle income settings as opposed to our uh, very high technology country that we're sitting in right now. Are we doing enough there to encourage that kind of innovation? That's a very loaded question. Yes, um, I figured you could handle so, it. Yeah, I, I think so too. So um, starting with the global health piece, um, I do think that we could do more to encourage that innovation. Um, I was lucky enough to just have an inkling to pursue science fair. It was just presented to me in a classroom saying, hey, I, I, my science teacher was like, I conduct the, um, the science fair for, um, for our chapter, our school and would love for anybody to participate. And for some reason, I raised my hand. Like I said, going into government policy, like, I was like, I know nothing about science. Um, but I raised my hand and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. Um, my mom always told me you can do anything you put your mind to. And that's something that stuck with me for, for a very long time. So um, in terms of innovation, like in education and in the classroom um, for our youth, um, I think that what Gitanjali kind of spoke on in her introduction is that it really does need to be integrated into every aspect of mm -hmm. our curriculum. And 
with that, I don't know what that looks like. I'm not an educator personally. Um, I did all of my research independently. So, um, so I'd love to work with, um, with my school district to, um, to encourage that innovation within the classroom. We actually have a, um, a project called STEM Innovator where um, people who are interested in innovation can pursue this option for, um, for school credit, I believe. And so, I mean, programs like that are always amazing to encourage um, young people to get involved beyond just day-to-day -day classroom activities. But what about the idea of some of that innovation focused on the rest of the world Absolutely. and not just on what we see right here in Aspen, Colorado? That's a really good point. Yeah. I, are we doing enough? Yeah, the, I feel like the question is more like, how do we get people to care about the rest of the world? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, how do we and get people to care about And care and do something. Exactly. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how we, how we get people to care about the rest of the world. I just know that. You do. I do, yeah. <laughs> and I know that um, my fellow panelists do as well. So honestly, um, my drive to care about the rest of the world comes from seeing various places and being a minority, understanding what it's like to not have, um, not have rights or not have um, mm -hmm. same privileges as other people. So I know that there are people on the other side of the world that don't have the same privileges as being in, in America. So. Um, I feel like to an extent that's that's what a lot of um, what a lot of young people of color um, experience. I think I think we're back to empathy, which yeah. is what Gitanjali was talking yeah. about. It's great to be an innovator, but if you don't combine that uh, exactly. with a sense uh, of wanting to help other people, the empathic response, uh -huh. then maybe you're a little off the track. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. So I so I was originally in like DEI work, so diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, in fact, when I was 15, I spoke at Harvard about a process that we were working on within my school. And with that, I was like, okay, I'm looking at everything through a DEI lens from, from my perspective, from how, how these other uh, circuits of, of equity, right? And that's how I looked at STEM. I looked at STEM through a DEI lens. Mm. Oh. That's what makes um, my innovation so interesting is because I didn't create this for high, like high income countries. I specifically created it for low and middle income countries. Got it. Yeah. So. And I'm glad you brought up DEI. And again, I think as we look at the future of STEM, it's absolutely clear uh, diversity equates to productivity. <laughs> it's not just a nice idea. <laughs> it's if we really want innovation to be successful, we have to have the kind of diversity you see sitting up here on the stage and not a bunch of people who all think the same way and come from the same background. So absolutely. this is a good example of our future. Gitanjali. Um, you go through this uh, remarkable list of things you've done while still not quite through high school. And um, I had a chance to get on the internet and look up a little bit about the book that you wrote uh, about how it is that you're encouraging others to do this. But say a little bit about some of the things that have made projects either work or not work. I mean, first of all, how important are mentors? And second, how do you deal with failure? Because even Gitanjali has probably had some failures. So. Hey, even Gitanjali, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, that's actually two chapters in my book. But <laughs> but I'm helping you sell your book, so go ahead. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I guess the biggest thing that I had to learn from you know, the ripe old age of 10 or 11 years old when I was starting this journey, I, first of all, I was very, very fortunate to find my passion at a, such an early age. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen to a lot of people. And it's not like you wake up one morning and you're like, oh my God, this is exactly what I want to do. It'll never be like that. It has never been like that. But it was almost this continuous idea of, and I guess this kind of attacks the how, like how do we make people care almost. Mm -hmm. It was this idea of I was always that kid who wanted to put a smile on everyone's face. I played piano at hospitals and assisted livings for so long. I was the person who would bring in presents during my birthday to give to other people. <laughs> um, I was that kid. And so that just st slowly started to combine with my love of science. And just together, that, that's really who I am, right? And I used to call it, I use science for kindness, which truly is what innovation is. And I think the biggest way to make people care is almost thinking like a little kid, not restricting yourself with a box around your head and not putting yourself out there and recognizing that, you know, oh, I might fail or I might mess up. The biggest thing that I learned with failure is the worst thing that's gonna happen is you mess up. Or the worst thing that's gonna happen is that someone says no, right? But there's never a limit to the amount of times you can keep trying. And especially as a student, it's better to mess up now when it doesn't matter than in the future where it might, right? <laughs> And so I, say, I like to say the same thing to a lot of like the adults and organizations that I speak to, right? 
when it comes to failure, it's only failure if you view it in that way, right? I like to look at failure as messing up when it doesn't matter and moving forward from there, making your ideas stronger, making your ideas better because without failure, the ideas that I have right now may not be at the place where it is today. Mm -hmm. I may have stopped where I wanted it to stop. I may not have grown it beyond what, what I thought could really happen. So that's a little bit about failure, but another thing that I had to get over was my fear of asking for help. Mm. Um, I've been a very, I guess, I'd like to say independent person. I was so, like, I was so, I guess, within myself, right? I had ideas, I wanted to get bring these ideas to life. I didn't want to accept help, right? The biggest thing that I also had to learn is it's okay to accept help, right? Especially when you're 12 or 13 years old, trying to get into a lab, trying to work on ideas, it's okay to ask for help. And so if I had to make one request to all of you, right, if you take away nothing else from what I say, it would be to um, you know, find a student or look for a mentee and mentor them, right? It doesn't have to be in an area that you know, you're personally passionate about, but find a way to guide them through their process. You know, if we were at a more you know, student-centric conference, I'd say find a student and hand them your business card, right? And when I talk to students, I always say, for every business card that you get handed, take advantage of it. Reach out to them, make that connection. And so mentorship has absolutely been one of the pillars of support in my journey, and I wouldn't be up on the stage without mentorship, without failures even across the way. And it's important to, it's, it's a learning experience, all of it is. So it's important to accept it and it will take time and it's much easier said than done. But it, it accounts for better ideas, better, I guess, better methods to keep growing your ideas and a stronger individual, I'd like to say as well. I really appreciate you gave a charge to this whole group <laughs> and I uh, hope everybody took that seriously. When you see the opportunity, uh, offer yourself as a mentor and it doesn't mean you have to be a world's expert in a particular space, but you're gonna help guide somebody's direction as they try to choose which kind of pathway, which kind of project to take on. Uh, maybe this one will be sort of for whoever wants to answer it. When I look at surveys of what is basically happening in Gen Z as far as career ideas, where people think they want to put their efforts, first of all, you see the recommendations from people who are studying the economy and looking to see where the jobs and the excitement is, and they are all saying STEM, STEM. There's so many opportunities here in STEM. But when you talk to the Gen Z students, you don't get quite that same level of enthusiasm. You all are exceptional in that regard, of course. <laughs> But across the board, there seems to be maybe more interest in the arts and humanities, which are also great. We had a wonderful session about arts last night. Uh, or maybe finance, everybody wants to get rich. Uh, by the way, STEM doesn't always get you there. Um, but what's the disconnect here? Why, why is it being, with all the opportunities now in science that you all know and I know and a lot of people in this room know are exceptional, just this exponential growth of opportunities across the board from physical science to life science. And yet, at the same time, doesn't seem to have necessarily caught the imagination of as large a group as I would hope to see. What's, what's happened there? Anybody want to uh, offer a diagnosis? I can kick it off, I think. Okay, go ahead, Katanzali. You think about this a lot, I know. <laughs> I think, you know, if we're thinking about the past, we were so focused on basically segmenting out individual fields that we kind of lost track of what science, or literally what l learning even is. Like what even is humanities if we think about it, right? Mm -hmm. In today's society, everything crosses over, right? We're looking at a multidisciplinary approach to learning in everything that we do. You can't go through an art course without learning about science. You can't go through a history course without learning about math, right? And as weird as that sounds, everything crosses over and everything has an impact on everything else. So I guess it's not you know, a lack of enthusiasm, but instead, not even shifting focus, I would say, but instead looking at being more, being more open-minded mm -hmm. to what truly is out there and recognizing that STEM by itself isn't just a field, right? There's no longer STEM majors, but we're looking at more joint majors and double majors and things that combine STEM and arts and STEM and humanities and history and math. And mm -hmm. I was talking to someone the other day and they had a math major and a philosophy minor. And I thought that was so interesting. And they had to write a thesis about how the two oh. compared. And um, just the concept of how things intertwine with each other is the reason that we're seeing more and more enthusiasm for other fields that aren't necessarily 
our main science, technology, engineering, math that we see out there. And I think that's amazing because we're giving more opportunities to people out there and students out there to discover what they truly are passionate about, even if it isn't just the raw sciences. Yeah. Because I can tell you, if I, like right now, if I had to pick what I'd want to do beyond high school, I would look at, you know, either joint major or double major in biomedical engineering, but also product design, but also look at how I'd be able to take up public service as part of that. You can't do individual things alone. Everything is important to be interconnected, and I'm glad that our generation and future generations are slowly coming to terms with that. And you know, 70% of the jobs that exist today aren't going to exist in the future. And I think it's a very, very important fact that people are really shifting ways to recognizing the power that cross-disciplinary fields really bring us in today's world. So yeah, message is maybe the pollsters need to rethink the way they're asking the question, <laughs> asking people to make a decision. Are you going into STEM? Are you going into something else? Maybe uh, that's the wrong question. Can I actually add on to that? Yeah, please do, Deja. Um, yeah. So I, I chose global health because I loved everything that I was learning within my research. Um, and I really craved that science aspect, right? But I feel like there's, a, there's this connotation that global health is just like STEM, biology, mm -hmm. um, chemistry, like all those things, physics even, like you can, you can take physics, I'm not taking physics. But, <laughs> um, um, but there's also this huge aspect of social science. It's literally the intersection of physical science, life science, and social science. Um, and that's the part that I crave. So this past year, I just finished my first year um, at the University of Iowa, and I took biology, but I also took health experience of immigrants, migrants, and refugees. I also took African-American women, health, hair, and sexuality. Like, that was a phenomenal course, by the way. Um, and so, like, you, you're, you're able to learn all of these different things and expand your horizons beyond just this rigorous academic track with mm -hmm. biology and, 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 the, and the physical hard sciences, right? Um, and so with that, I feel like Gen Z is really getting in tune with wanting to change the world, but going about it in a different way than the people before us. I feel like the people before us are all like, you have to do it this way with this STEM major. And, and really, Gen Z is getting in tune with their creative side and expanding their minds to, to, to music, as we were talking about last night, and, um, and physical arts, and, and all of those things. So I feel like that also plays a huge That's role. That's a really good point. Uh, and we're going to go to your questions in just a moment, so uh, please get ready for that. I asked Haley, what, what would you say, though, in terms of how we're doing as far as STEM careers for women? Um, uh, we, there's a new category of people advocating for this. We call them STEMinists, and I think uh, the more of that we have. And it's gratifying to see in the... Uh, life sciences now, more than half of the PhDs are women, but it's not translating necessarily uh, into the subsequent more senior positions. We still have a lot of work to do there. There's something about life science careers, at least in academia and probably in industry as well, that aren't all that welcoming sometimes uh, to, to diverse individuals, including women. So you, you must think about this a bit from your perspective. What should we be doing uh, to make STEM careers even more welcoming uh, to women, because we need those talents even more than ever. Got any thoughts there? That's a fantastic question. Um, I would say, you know, I can only speak to the public policy space, which is an often forgotten part of STEM. Um, it works a lot with like data and research, and um, not a lot of people understand that that's part of STEM. But it is an interesting perspective to come at this from, because public policy also intersects a lot with humanities and the arts and social sciences, which I feel is more um, welcoming towards young women in, this, in these spaces. Um, but I would say that the most important thing to encourage in young women in STEM is mentorship, mentorship like Katanjali mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also like to speak to how to encourage more young people in STEM. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this term this weekend, um, Gen Z will save the world. And I think that goes along with like all of these different Gen Z, you know, diverse people, women in Gen Z, and um, you know, Gen Z will save the world, but the reality is we shouldn't have to. And, um, <laughs> and I know that many people at this conference definitely agree, um, but I'd just like to plant that seed with you guys as people that probably work with a lot of younger people. And there's a few different pillars that I think we could do a better job at when engaging our youth. We need to be intentional when we're engaging Gen Z, especially Gen Z that come from diverse backgrounds and women in Gen Z. Um, first of all, number one, compensation. Um, we need to compensate our young people in advocacy with money. 
not just you know mentorship and your time, but this takes a significant amount of um, time and undertaking and research mm -hmm. and expertise that needs compensation. Um, second is understanding that although um, we are all experts in our field, no one Gen Z youth can speak for the entire age group of young people. Um, and then lastly, understanding that um, you know, you're asking a group that is facing many inequalities to solve their own inequalities, mm -hmm. and sometimes yours as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to be intentional when you're engaging youth and be vulnerable back to them about um, your own life experiences and opening up that space for people trying to um, progress in this field. And another thing I'd like to mention is also reevaluating your um, criteria for credibility. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing people have to be experts younger and younger and accomplish these exceptional things at such a young age just to be heard as a young person. And all of the young people that I work with, I like to tell them that you do not have to be exceptional to have your voice heard. You deserve that as is. Yeah. That's a great answer. I would like to add on to that one too. Okay, before, before quick, we go yeah, quick response and then we'll go to questions. Awesome, so yes, policy is so important. Um, <laughs> I, so I come from a, so I went to high school uh, where we were on track to become a almost majority minority school um, by I think this following academic year. Um, however, that wasn't reflected in our, um, in our AP honors classes, like, like really at all. I was an AP honors student, so I was quite the exception in, um, in that school district. Um, but when we talk about not inviting spaces, I mean, I was often the, the only black person there the only black woman at times, the, possibly the only queer person, and and um, I would just and I was in STEM, and I would never forget the time that I went to my very first science fair, and I was the only black person in the room there as well. I won first place, but I was the only <laughs> black person there. And, and, um, and so when we talk about these these spaces, I mean, we really need more people who look like us in these places. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, like criteria for, for young people to not, not be exceptional to get their voices heard is, is huge. Um, but also people, um, like other, other people who are currently scientists, who are um, currently maybe like in a lab, um, really need to like re reach out, people of color specifically, really need to reach out um, to young people of color who are also interested in these things because like we need that, uh, we need that mentorship too. I was able to get it from various places and just kind of go at it um, on my own, but to an extent like, we, we need more people who look like us. And that's what I've done with, um, with my, my recent career, my newfound career, um, and going to the youth and really like sharing my story and saying like, this is, this is what I did. You don't have to do it this way, but this is what I did. And you can do it too. Like, so th that's so important. So you're becoming the mentor now. Absolutely. So, good for you. <laughs> we have a question here in front and one over here. We have microphones running around. Here we come. Awesome. Literally running around. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Stand up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I like to make a brief comment and then ask a question. Okay, to make it quick, please, because <laughs> we have a lot of people with hands up. You guys are like stem cells. You're pluripotential. You can do anything you want to do. Expose yourself to as many different things as you can while you're young, young, and especially meet as many people in as many different fields until you find out where you want to start. And that may not even be your last job. So my question for you is, uh, my wife and I work in the field of early, early childhood education. We're trying to solve the literacy crisis of why only 35% of fourth graders read. We have our own ideas. We've been working on this for 12 years. We learn from our experience, from talking to teachers, but we never get to ask students. You guys are very bright. I would love to hear from you. Why do you where do you see the, pl the problems in the education system are that kids are not learning to read? So we probably don't have time for each of you to answer that, but would somebody like to volunteer to respond? I can talk okay. about it. Okay, <laughs> you got it. Awesome. I'm taking notes. <laughs> Perfect. I guess um, I've had a little bit of experience with early education, most of it focusing around innovation. Um, I've had students understand what 3D printing is, but still can't un like write out the ABCDs um, who are in kindergarten, right? And I think the biggest thing that I've learned is the only thing that pushes these students back is self-doubt. That's really mm. self-doubt. It's, that's the biggest thing that I've seen in any elementary mm. schooler is this idea that they have 
it's almost inherited this idea of self-doubt that they can't do something just because the people around them can't do it either, right? When you grow up in this environment, and it's completely different with COVID and things like that as well, but it, you grow up in this environment where you're seeing people around you and you constantly put that pressure on you that I can't do this, right? And then from teachers' perspective and everything like that, they have a set curriculum. They have something that they have to follow. Not all of it is tailored towards a specific student or a specific group of people, which sometimes makes it so that all of these students feel like they have to be a carbon copy of each other, right? Mm -hmm. Do things in the same way, do things with the, you know, even as simple as doing things with the same handwriting in, I can tell you in second grade, I tried to change my handwriting to make it look like my best friend's handwriting. <laughs> And it's something as simple as that, right? If curriculums aren't tailored towards a student, and this goes far beyond just illiteracy as well, if curriculums aren't tailored to a student, whether that be innovation or anything around it, the student won't feel like they're where they're supposed to be. The student will feel like they're out of place and they won't have the same, or they won't put themselves out there for the same opportunities and they will always carry that self-doubt behind them. So, um, great answer. Yeah, I think we should keep going. Over here. Hi there, I'm Shauna Butler. I am a nurse. I am obsessed with the economics, business model, and technology of healthcare delivery. And I'm really worried about our current and our future workforce. Nursing is not perceived as um, a science, as a STEM. What is the message that a 15-year-old young man needs to hear that's gonna be really attractive to say, come and join this workforce and do this incredible work that spans all sorts of global health, technology, public policy, mental health. Mm -hmm. So she said, young man, Avi, I think that's yours. <laughs> um, is your question like, what would, it, what would inspire a young man to pursue? What's the message that we need to deliver and at what point? What's the message that we need to be delivering to youth and at what point to say, consider nursing, come and join us? <laughs> Um, well, nursing is a, a very important career. My, both my parents are doctors, so I see a lot of nurses, and I've been inside that environment a lot. Um, I mean, uh, the, wor the world needs a lot of nurses. They're very important for all kinds of things, like administering vaccines all around the world, um, like we were talking about that yesterday. Um, I guess uh, they should probably be paid a lot more. That's <laughs> there <important>. you go. <laughs> Cheers. And, uh, and treated a lot better. I mean, I see a lot of nurses at my mom's work. I mean, they, I think uh, a lot of patients kind of disregard the nurses sometimes, but they should, you know, they're, they're very important. Um, and I, I hope that more people realize that and more people join nursing. It's a great career. Okay. Um, how about right here? Hi, I'm Valerie Kahn. I work in science philanthropy. I assume all of you had, have had to fundraise or seek funds at some point for your projects. Um, I'd love to hear from one, maybe Daisha, um, what your experience with, with getting funds to do your projects has been. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I started my fundraising with just like prize money from my, um, from my science fair winnings. And, um, and I think it's really funny. I bootstrapped my entire like my entire thing together, um, using like allowance that I would get every month, um, and like going to buy new materials. Time, right? Um, I don't pay myself. This research is very selfless work, as, <laughs> as I'm sure some of you know. Um, but moving toward like creating this company and um, people really wanting to support what I do. Um, press helped a lot with that. So I was featured on the Ellen show prior to her last season, um, like the PBS News Hour and a lot of um, very well known um, news outlets. And I became somewhat of a local celebrity uh, within my hometown. So I go to the University of Iowa, it's the same place as my high school, junior high, what have you. And so business owners um, within the area really wanted to support what I did. And so they were willing to give me money and um, help me keep going because there's something about like an Iowa spirit. Like, you know, that, that's like, I, I'm not from Iowa, but like, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like she did this in Iowa. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's really helped a lot. And um, beyond that, just people who see me on social media um, have offered like sort of brand partnerships as well. Um, so just different avenues. I would love to pursue that more, so. Open. <laughs> great, great question. 
Um, I have a hand up here and then one there, and that may be about what we can take Just here because we've got a few more minutes. My name is Peter Rigby. Avi, <clears throat> you might not want to actually answer this question because of the nature of the question, but with so many impressions on all your websites, you must be vulnerable to hackers with nefarious intentions who hmm. just want to frustrate your efforts because they're so successful. What do you have to do for cybersecurity and protection? Yeah, so that, that has been kind of fun so far. There's been a, a lot of people that have tried to take these websites down, especially the coronavirus one at the very start. Um, the most common attack is like a DDoS attack where people basically try and flood the servers by just like bots and spamming it to, to make it go down. And they tried very hard at the start. Um, I've worked with the CIA and the NSA a little bit with the Ukrainian site to make sure that the security is top notch. As well. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, I just, I've been work, I've been coding for over a decade by now. So oh. making these websites, I, I, I kind of, I'm not like an industry professional, but I, I know a little bit what I'm doing. Make sure that there's no gaps. Um, I have a lot of friends that are cybersecurity experts as well, so I've worked with them and like done all these crazy things to see if there's any possible gaps. I've worked with a lot of like user experience research teams and just to find any like vulnerabilities or anything like that. But um, I mean, at this point, I'd, I'd say I know what I'm doing, but like not really. Of course, uh, I'm sure <laughs> someone will find a way to hack them. But I try and just make the websites pretty simple. They're not like extremely complicated at the end of the day. Um, and so I can make sure that every single tiny part of it is, is perfect. And so far there hasn't been any real hacks, but uh, a lot of people have tried. It's pretty fun to see. I have like a little like admin dashboard where I can see when people try and DDoS the website. Um, a lot of them from China at the very start, mm -hmm. from, uh, which was very interesting, but mm. it's, been, it's been really fun. I have to say. <laughs> oh yeah, really fun. Yeah. Over here. Oh, the kid has a question. I'm sorry? The kid, the kid has a question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. hang on. <laughs> I didn't see in the back. Okay, you're next uh, after this. Yeah. Um, hopefully my question <laughs> will be quick. I was at the disinformation session yesterday, and one, one of the presenters said that the U.S. is now one of the biggest exporters of misinformation in the world, okay. and that scared the crap out of me <laughs> because true. it was such a black hole of my knowledge of issues that are really bubbling up to the surface. Yeah. So for you, what is the biggest issue that people older than you have missed and that we need to pay more attention to you. Mm. Abby, do you want to talk about misinformation exporting? Because most of it's on the internet. What, what, what have we done wrong here? And how do we fix it? Um, I, think, <laughs> I think the biggest issue with this misinformation is just that it spreads so quickly. I, mm. I spend a lot of time on social media on places like Twitter. And it's very easy for me to just retweet something um, that just like a headline I see and I retweet mm. that and maybe real and maybe not real. Um, and people will just eat that up very easily. And I think that's just a big problem with all social medias in general, like on Facebook, Reddit, whatever. You can just share stuff without really spending a lot of time critically thinking about it or anything like that. I mean, m many times I'll just read the headline of something myself and be like, that, that's pretty cool, and not actually go and read the article and understand all the nuance about it. Um, I think that's a big issue. I don't really know if that's going to be solved anytime soon, but. Um, I bet someone else here can talk a lot about misinformation as well, but on the internet it spreads very rapidly and I think it's a huge issue. Um, but at the same time, like what really is misinformation and who, who's the person that's gonna say what misinformation is? Like uh, the quote from this comic book I like, who watches the Watchmen? Um, but yeah. Um, so I'd yeah, like wouldn't it be good if we would all make a pledge not to share information unless we were sure it was true? If we all decided to do that today, uh, this would be a big step forward, but nobody seems willing to go there. We're really tight on time, so we're going to take the question from the back. And please identify yourself. <laughs> um, I wondered, how did you get your goal and when did you get it? Oh. <laughs> how do you get your goal? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, first of all, I'd like to add to the misinformation question. That's a fantastic question, oh, especially sorry. in the policy <laughs> field. Um, and real quickly, I just, I think that um, older generations need to understand that young people want small bites of information. They want infographics, they want 30 second videos, and those are the most susceptible forms of media to misinformation, because oftentimes these large articles um, are hidden behind paywalls and in textbooks, and they're really hard to digest, especially for young people who are looking for resources um, that are really hidden behind like jargon and academic language. So I think that's one thing we can do to address it. Um, and then thank you for your question. That was fantastic. Um, I reached, it was when and how? It was what is, like, 
What is your goal? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'd say that I haven't reached all of my goals yet. I think that like many of us can relate to that. We never stop having more goals to reach. Um, and I'd say that I've fulfilled, you know, the most important ones to my core values, which is um, reaching out to other young people, inspiring people, being vulnerable and sharing my story, and um, being happy day to day. Um, but your personal and professional goals are never going to stop progressing. So um, don't give up on your goals. Keep, keep going, and don't be scared if they grow bigger as you grow older. Mm -hmm. That was a great question and a great way to sort of wind us up here because we are now at time. I warned the panelists I was going to ask them at the very end, do you have hope for the future? So maybe I'll just take a <laughs> yes or a no here, and we'll <laughs> see how we're doing. So do you have hope? And you have one sentence, why? Um, not really. Um, <laughs> Yesterday, okay, I woke next. up with less rights, so. <laughs> um, I'd say I'd definitely say I do. Just for you, too. You know, I do. I mean, Gen Z's, again, like we were saying, is changing the world for the better. We're coming together, finally, to solve problems that we see. Yeah, I have hope for the future. Even though Gen Z shouldn't have to be the only source thereof. <laughs> if we're going to save the world, these folks are going to do a lot to make it happen, but it's up to all the rest of you as well. Please thank our amazing panel.